Greetings from the East Tennessee History Center, located on Gay Street in downtown Knoxville. The History Center is a public-private partnership between the Knox County Public Library and the nonprofit East Tennessee Historical Society and Museum, and it works to benefit the entire region. The building houses the East Tennessee Historical Society and its Museum of East Tennessee History, the Calvin M. McClung Historical Collection, the Tennessee Archive of Moving Image and Sound, and the Knox County Archives. Within its walls, visitors can find extensive genealogical records, manuscripts, maps, and histories dating back to before the establishment of the state of Tennessee. Interdisciplinary works from local historians acknowledge the roles race, gender, and class play in society and highlight the diverse perspectives of the region. Stop by today and uncover your past. My name is Joan Kite, and I am here to host uh, the next 45 minutes. I would like to welcome everyone on behalf of Humanities Tennessee, and I want you to know that if you're watching on Facebook Live or YouTube and you want to ask questions during this session, you'll need to either download the festival app or visit the streaming site via the link at www humtn.org forward slash sfb. I also want you to know that Parnassus is our bookseller and that their purchases of the book via Parnassus help to keep the festival free. Yay! Humanities Tennessee staff will place the book by links for that session at the top of the chat. The festival is a free nonprofit event that is suppo supported in part by donations from individuals. If you appreciate the event and want to support it, you can do so by visiting our website at www.humtn.org. We will post the link to the donate page as well. I also want you to know that the festival has an inclusion policy and just be aware, we just are friends with everybody, so please be appropriate in your comments in the chat. And uh, that's it. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. And now I'm going to introduce our authors today. We have Laura Elliott, who goes by L.M. Elliott, and we have Jennifer Lee Schott. And they both write books about dogs and people's relationships with dogs. And I will let you tell tell I will let them tell you more about that. They're actually going to do readings from their books. And uh, Laura, would you like to start? Okay. Um, I actually. This is this yeah, is my, the book Storm Dog that I'm going to read from. And actually, it's kind of an unusual narrative for me. and was uh, great fun for me to write. I'm typically writing historical or biographical fiction. Um, and this is very, this is contemporary first person uh, about a, a misfit, slightly quirky, um, whip smart 14 year old girl named Ariel who feels is having trouble fitting in or knowing who she is. And she finds her redemption and self definitions through nature, music, uh, friendship with an Afghanistan war veteran, um, a lost dog that she finds um, in the hilltop or who finds her and dog dancing and the Shenandoah Apple Blossom Festival Parade. And it came about because I was a journalist for a really long time. And um, so I really know about, you know, looking for story and sometimes story, those of you who want to be writers, stories just drop right in front of you and you've got to follow it. Um, I opened a National Geographic one day and about 10 years ago and saw an article about the, the power, the healing power of dance. Um, and there was this 
photo essay that included dogs dancing, um, which I thought, what in the world is that? I've never heard of that. I've had rescue dogs all my life. I've had nine of them now, and uh, but I'd never heard of dog dancing. So the story sort of came from there. So I'm gonna read about um, three minutes here of when Ariel, my protagonist, um, meets this dog who becomes so critically important to her um, and her life. Uh, she's just had a really bad morning at home. Um, her beauty pageant, beautiful big sister is kind of the center of attention and she has felt completely ignored. And so she's taken to the hills of Virginia uh, near the Blue Ridge um, for to find some solace. <clears throat> Uh, being way up on a mountain all alone, remembering these things about George, who is a big brother who's been deployed to Afghanistan, finally brought on tears. I felt so lonely with my big brother gone. I buried my face in my arms and sobbed. No one was around to make fun of me for it, so I let fly. But when I started sucking in dirt from the ground as I heaved, I figured I'd better stop before I choked. I lifted my head to spit out soil, and that's when I saw the dog staring through the grasses at me. My heart rate hit about 100 miles per hour. I knew I'd been blubbering, but that dog getting so close without my hearing was plain old creepy. I stayed frozen, chin to the ground, just like it was. The wind was swishing the veil of grasses open and shut, so my view was like a bad Wi-Fi connection. Clear than not, clear than not. But a couple of things I could see for sure. The dog had enormous ears, looking straight up, quivering with listening. His face was long and golden, ending in a snout in black and big nostrils, twitching like crazy to get my scent. Now, dogs are pretty much a way of life around here. The master of the hounds for our local hunt lives one farm over and breeds fox hounds. I'm about the only kid in the county whose mother says we can't have a dog because they're too messy. I mean, this is a place where muck boots lacquered with horse manure sit beside the back doors of most homes. So I used to spend a lot of time playing with my neighbor's puppies. Those hounds love to chase things, jumping and knocking into one another in a pack of clumsy loudness. They bark and they, they bark and bay and yap. You can hear them coming a mile away. So I'd never seen a dog that quiet, that watchful, that still. I raised my head slowly to get a better look. The dog pressed himself even flatter to the ground. The poor thing was thin and covered in mud like he had been on the run for quite a while. Hey, fella, I said quiet and easy. The dog started trembling. Oh, easy boy, I'm not going to hurt you. I sat up. The dog speeded backward as fast as a getaway car from a movie bank heist. Oh, no, fella, I didn't mean to scare you. I stood holding out my hand. Easy. For a moment, the dog hesitated. But then he turned, touched his furry plume of a tail tight behind his hind legs and slunk toward the nearby woods. He whipped his head from side to side, scanning the landscape. It was a gorgeous German Shepherd, really kind of noble looking except for the dirt and burrs caking his fur. Every 20 feet or so, he'd stop and look over his shoulder at me like he was too scared to ask directly for help, but hoping I could see the need, begging me to follow. So I did. Higher into the hillside woods we climbed. The itty bitty path we took narrowed and grew brambly, clearly cut not by park rangers, but by deer meandering through their territory. I was constantly getting caught up in the thorny wild rose bushes. The dog would slow down and sniff everything, checking the perimeter, while I pulled the coiling branches off my jacket and pants legs. Then he'd inch onward. It was like we were out on some kind of combat patrol. The woods grew thicker and darker, so I couldn't really see the sky anymore, but I could feel the weight of air changing, getting thick and charged. My asthma kicked in and I wheezed. I knew what it all meant. A storm was brewing in the valley and heading my way fast, but I just couldn't stop following that dog. Ten more minutes. The forest shifting shadows darkened into eerie, and I got as jumpy as a dog. My hands were so torn up from thorns, I thought I might burst into tears again. Stop, I cried. Where are you going? Now, I know. It's stupid to ask a dog a question. That's how scared I'd gotten. Believe it or not, that dog stopped. He sat down and stared at me, completely silent. No panning, no scratching, no whining, no nothing. The only sound was wind stroking the trees, their translucent leaves shimmering with the touch, like when a drummer brushes the Swiss symbol of a drum set. Then I heard something that made absolutely no sense. The dog cocked his head too to listen. There it was again, ping, a resonating bell, and then ping, 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 ka ching ka ching in an answering chorus of musical notes. I don't want to tell you the word I said. It would prove all the church ladies' opinions of me. At the sound of those little bells, I figured the angel Gabriel or something from the other not so nice side of the biblical spectrum was coming to get me. Then, to make it all totally Harry Potter forbidden forest-like, the woods lit up in a flash. Bang! Lightning hit something. 
A long growling rumble rolled around and around, the hills getting louder and faster, like a gigantic loose cannonball looking for something to slam against and explode to smithereens. The dog howled, an outcry that made my skin prickle and my heart pound. Then he bolted. Wait, I shrieked, wait for me. I thrashed after him. Another flash of scalding light, then an earthly blackness. Bang, the ground shook. Wait, pushing through bushes as desperate as if I was doing the breaststroke in flood water, I belly flopped onto a clearing. The storm was getting vicious, fast. Fallen pine needles that had carpeted the clearing levitated and swirled in little cyclones. Trees groaned in the wind. Diving into a thicket on the edge of that opening, the dog crouched there, shaking, looking toward the porch of a cabin that was at the other end of the clearing. Like he was saying, hey, stupid, I found you shelter. Go for it. That was that was great. And actually, what comes after that is the, is crazy. Um, <laughs> that's where he meets. Uh, that's where she meets a very good friend, Sergeant, who is a woman who is going to become a very good friend named Sergeant Josie. But you don't know it at first, right? Because I think she has a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, yeah, that's wonderful. And um, Jennifer, who is the author of a number one New York Times bestseller, Max, Best Friend, Hero, Marine, about the coolest war dog ever. She is also the author of the Hero and Scout series, a Los Angeles native. She graduated from Vassar and has an MFA in nonfiction from Columbia, a senior editor for... Mm -mm. Uh, she is now an editor at The Week Junior, a news magazine for 8 to 14 years old. And uh, she she uh, yeah, she has a book series, Hero Scout, and wrote Max. So anyway, um, welcome again. And uh, we are so glad you're here. And you are also going to read something, yes? I'd be happy to. And thank you, Joan. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here with Laura, who... I, it's amazing how much we have in common and how much yeah. our writing overlaps, which I don't think we realized until we got to know each other this week. Yeah. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, my new book series is called American Dog. Uh, yeah. There are four books in the series. Two came out in April and two are coming out in three days. This is one of the ones that's about to come out. It's called American Dog Star. And each of the books is set in a different state in the US and um, tries to, I really tried to capture a little bit about each state and very much, not, maybe not as personally as Laura did in her beautiful book, but um, there are certain dogs that are more popular or even native to the state or are there, there's such a thing as a state dog, which I did not know yeah. until I started researching these books. So um, this book is, um, it feels very special to me. It's set in Michigan. And this book is about a boy named Julian who is 12 years old. And he is, uh, he has dyslexia and he really struggles a lot in school. And he struggles at home too, because he feels like his family really doesn't have the patience for his, the trouble he has doing his schoolwork and reading. Um, and he feels lost at school because people tease him and he just doesn't feel like he has anyone on his side. So he's feels like a misfit um, and feels very lonely and doesn't have the support that he needs. And he feels like the world moves so quickly for him and it's hard for him to keep up. So as the, as the novel begins, he meets a kid named Brian who is kind of the weird kid at school. He's the kid who gets teased in the cafeteria. And at first Julian's not sure he wants to be friends with him because he's he's like, this is only gonna make my status worse at school. But they end up working together at an animal shelter where they get to be fast friends and where Julian meets a dog named Star. And Star um, is deaf and no one can communicate with her. No one at the shelter has been able to get through to her. She's too scared of everybody. And so she hides in her cage and she's this beautiful dog. There's a reflection, but 
she's a beautiful dog and Julian sees something in her eyes that he just, he feels a connection to her right away. So he and Brian set out to, to train her and to bond with her and sure enough, Julian and Star become very close and he needs to convince his parents to let him have her. Um, oh, and Star, do you need to know this for this reading? Star belonged to an elderly woman who died who had no family, which is why she ended up in the shelter. So at any rate, at this point in the book, the shelter is about to close because it's run out of money. It's no longer being funded. And the boys are in a panic because they'll do anything to save all these dogs that they've come to love so much. So Julian thinks that he knows where a hidden treasure is buried on a, on a little piece of land near their home. After they'd been walking for what felt like an hour, they stopped at the edge of an old steel rail bridge that carried the tracks across the river. According to Julian's map, the road was just on the other side of it. The bridge was just wide enough for one train to pass. There was no walkway. They would have to walk right down the tracks. What if a train comes while we're on the bridge? Brian asked qu quietly. Julian swallowed hard. It looks so old. Do you think any trains still go over it? Brian shook his head. I really hope not. With a solemn nod, Julian stepped out onto the bridge and began to make his way across. Star trotted close by his side, but the farther along they got, the more the dog tried to pull them back the way they had come. I think she's afraid of crossing, Julian said over his shoulder to Brian, who marched right behind him. That makes two of us, Brian said. Do you think this is safe? Just be careful where you step, Julian said. I'm sure it's fine. Brian craned his neck to look over the bridge railing without getting too close. Moonlight shone on the dark water, churning far below. It's a long way down, Brian said. Julian stepped carefully over a big gap in the wood beneath their feet. Star leaped gracefully over it, but as soon as she landed, she froze. Julian stopped short, and Brian nearly bumped into him. Hang on. Julian squatted down and signaled to Star. She came to him for a second, but then tried to pull him back in the other direction. When he didn't budge, she looked him square in the eye, held his gaze and whined as if she were desperate to tell him something. Julian sighed. I know it's scary, he said soothingly, but it's the only way home. I promise we'll be over the bridge before you know it. The sooner the better, Brian said. Come on, Star. I don't like this any more than you do. Julian wrapped the leash around his hand so he could keep Star close. She walked with him, but her ears were pinned back against her head and she kept glancing around with big, worried eyes. Julian gave her lots of thumbs up signs to encourage her. You're being so brave, girl. Look, we're almost halfway there. Julian, this time Brian had stopped short. What? Before Julian could get the rest of the word out, he felt something that made him fall silent. It was, what was it? He focused on the strange sensation rising up from his feet, a faint vibration through the soles of his shoes. At first it felt like pins and needles, but then it became more of a rumble than a tingle. He and Brian locked eyes, both boys realizing what was happening at the exact same time. They suddenly understood what Star had been trying to tell them. She wasn't afraid of the bridge. She was afraid of the train. Run, Julian and Brian screamed in unison. The train was getting closer. They heard it clearly in the distance and they raced ahead as quickly as they could, leaping over, jump over bumpy boards and missing planks. Star led the way. She might not be able to hear it, but she'd felt it coming long before they did. The rumbling beneath their feet grew more intense. Julian glanced over his shoulder and saw the moonlight glinting off the front of the train, which was now bearing down on them in the darkness. The engine roared through the woods behind them. In another second, it would reach the bridge. They weren't going to make it across in time. Julian kept his eyes on the tracks, too scared to look behind him again. The rails vibrated as the train got closer and closer, and soon the whole bridge felt as if it were being shaken by a giant. Right behind Julian, Brian stumbled over a crack and barely managed to keep his footing. Julian reached out to steady his friend. With one hand holding the leash and the other on Brian's arm, he pulled Brian forward, both of them breathing hard. They had to keep moving, even though there was no way they could outrun a train. Maybe Star could if she wasn't on her leash, but she didn't try to pull away. She wasn't going to leave the boys behind. Suddenly, Star stopped short, and to Julian's horror, she dove through a gaping hole in the wood at their feet, 
disappearing from view. Julian's heart leaped into his throat. Where was she? Did Star just dump into the, jump into the water? But the bridge was way too high. She would never survive. He looked up at Brian, who was staring with wide, shocked eyes at the place where Star had disappeared. Behind him, Julian saw the train barreling toward them, a huge black shadow against the night sky. Julian's mind spiraled through a thousand terrified and heartbreaking thoughts at once, but one was more urgent than all the others. They had to keep moving, but no way would he leave without Star. He looked down at the leash wrapped around his wrist, and that's when it hit him. The leash hadn't gone taut. Star hadn't fallen. She had to be right below them. Down, Julian shouted at Brian. With not a half second to waste, the boys dropped down into a gap in the boards just wide enough for them to slip through. They landed on the wide steel beams of the trestle below and crawled over to where Star crouched, waiting for them. They had followed her blindly, trusting her with their lives for the second time that day, and they had made it to safety just in time. Hmm. That's a great reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Dogs Ooh. save lives, people. That's the takeaway. Dogs save lives. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, how did you both end up writing about that age group? Young people, you know, teenagers. I mean, how did you end up doing that? Jen, you want to go? Sure. Um, I have a, I'm going to gamble on this and bet that Laura, like me, was probably a big reader as a child. <laughs> and that reading was a huge part of your life as it was mine. And for me, reading was just, I mean, it was, it was an escape. It was an education. Um, having the opportunity to read is, it's, it's democracy. That's how you learn about the world. Right. And so, to me, it just, um, I hadn't really thought about writing kid books for kids. And then it sort of fell into my lap and it was the most natural thing in the world. And it ha so happens that I work for kids magazines, but also that my kids, my own kids are in the same age range as my readers. So it all came together at this funny moment in life. So right now that your kids are that age range? Yeah. Right now? And what were your favorite books when you were young? Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> oh, I meant to ask Laura. I used to love this book by Farley Moat, um, The Dog Who Wouldn't Be. He's a Canadian writer. It was one of my favorite books when I was a kid. And I need to reread it because I'm not exactly sure that it's still okay. <laughs> I have to reread it to make sure before I recommend it to anyone. Um, but I loved Ellen Raskin, The Westing Game. Um, I loved, oh, so many. I liked a lot of mysteries. Um, of course, Judy Bloom. How about you, Laura? Yes, but you know, I'm older than you are. So I would have, I think we're going to have a different set of needs <laughs> that we would have had. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, with the way that I ended up writing for kids, actually, I kind of, I tend to call myself an accidental novelist. I, mm -hmm. I was a journalist for 20 years. I, I'm sorry, forgive me if I'm repeating myself. I'm not sure we did my bio, but I was a senior writer with the Washingtonian Magazine for 20 years. I ended up taking this lovely sidestep um, to highly fictionalize um, my dad's homecoming story from World War II that I had written for an issue of the magazine. He had one of those extraordinary World War II stories where he had been missing in action for months. He was a bomber pilot um, and wow. his family thought he was dead. And he literally showed up in the driveway at the family farm five days before Christmas, 1944. Wow. Uh, so, so um, and my kids were about y'all, your, your children, Jennifer, your children's ages at that time. And I received so many letters and just amazing stories from people writing in their, you know, their family's stories um, that I decided to write um, about World War II and these um, young fly boys, but mostly the French civilians who saved them, not the resistance, but the French civilians who would help these boys. Um, for teenagers, because I was realizing that, you know, they were sort of losing the story. Um, I mean, the story of World War II at that time, most of the veterans were in their late seventies now, as you know, they're in their nineties, you know? So, and so often, even though they study something like World War II in school, 
um, they they definitely um, you know it, it, historical fiction that's well done and well researched humanizes all of that for them, right? So I did that for Catherine Teagan at HarperCollins. I was so incredibly lucky to do that novel with her under War Torn Sky, and I was so lucky with it and it's done so well. I had done 10 other books since then and um, I've been just very lucky. So that's, that's, but this particular one really did come from the fact that I picked up a National Geographic when I'll be honest, I was, I was getting through cancer treatments and I was so delighted by it. And you get this training as a journalist, you know, if you spot something that you've never heard of before, it's like, Whoa, what's that? I want to know more about that. And um, this, so this idea of doing something about dog dancing, but dogs, I've grown up with dogs. I've always taken rescue dogs because they need homes. And as a matter of fact, Jenna, I tell you, my absolutely most beloved one was deaf and older when I took her in. And she was the sweetest and kindest. And You're kidding me. No. So anyway, so that's kind of how I came to do that. Storm dog, my storm dog, Jen has a storm dog as well. <laughs> <laughs> By coincidence. <laughs> But my storm dog has a lot of different themes about this girl who's a misfit and trying to find redemption in a lot of different ways and self-definition through imagination. And, and dog dancing is so wonderfully unique and creative. It seemed like a wonderful symbol for individuality and self-expression. So, Yeah, yeah. And who knew it existed? It was so fun to learn about it. I know. And it actually, it's a big thing. If you go to, <laughs> if you go to my website, you can see, especially in England, they love it. Of course, the Brits do, right? What's their croft, the big uh, dog show? They have days of dog dancing. And it is, really? a, yes, it is delightful. <laughs> you, need to go, you need to watch it. And it is so creative. And I tell you, part of how you know this as you sometimes you save dream and take different elements of your own personal life when you're writing. Um, my daughter was a big equestrian with Pony Club. Um, she was an inventor. You can probably catch part of that in my writing too, you know, that love mm -hmm. of rolling hills. Um, there's a component to that uh, that's dressage. It's not just cross country and stadium, there's dressage. And some of those girls also did musical freestyle dressage. And right. so I have witnessed wow. that creativity and that hard work and could translate it, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and that work is the result of, I think, what's central to to both of our books, which is that incredibly strong bond between a kid and an animal. Um, yes. It's unlike anything else. Your books that I've read now, I've, I'm so delighted in them this past week. You're so good at capturing how um, it's really kind of life altering and life saving, you know, that bond with a dog. So I really applaud your doing that repeatedly so beautifully and uniquely in each story um, because you know for kids who need that your books will really help them see that that's where they may find you know a lot of this support that they need and the dogs it's true. Learn, right? it's true and the dogs learn right along with them too which is the fun part yeah so i'm curious as writers um you know i'm part of a book club on facebook and the administrator of that, who is the book editor at the Miami Herald, um, is constantly asking how the pandemic is affecting the reading. And so I'm wondering, well, if the, is the pandemic affecting your writing? I mean, are you writing more? Are you saying, oh, I'm, I don't know what to do? I mean, <laughs> I love Laura's face. What do you think, Laura? I know the look on your face is great. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. My mind was going to like all the things we've all had to deal with with the pandemic. Um, and you know, the thing I think, I think actually what is happening is that you're seeing um, a lot of people who may not have had the chance. Jennifer and I are lucky in that we write professionally. We are able to make our livings as writers, right. mm -hmm. um, as journalists and as novelists both. Right. Um, some people haven't had that chance to get in yet. And I think what's happening during the pandemic is that you're having a lot of, you know, enforced um, time to be able to write. But I tell you, I'm sure Jennifer is like this too, especially since she's a working mom. You know, you work in between the slats of your children's lives, right? And you learn to do it when you have that moment and you don't dilly dally about it. Right. right? So. Except now they never leave the house. 
They're here 24 seven. I said to someone the other day, there is not a corner of my house where I can not be seen or heard. It's at, everywhere I go, I'm at risk of being seen in my pajamas <laughs> or heard <laughs> talking to myself um, in front of an entire class full of people. Right. So, so um, do you have a pandemic dog in your future? Um, I mean, do you, you are? I have, I have a dog. You know, meaning in your writing, you know, are you going to have a, you know, you, you could do that, Jennifer. That would be an interesting story, wouldn't it? That, that would you know, be an interesting story. Um, I think what I would probably write about is the mental decline of my, my crazy <laughs> dog as she <laughs> grows accustomed to having humans around all the time and at first loves it and then decides that she really wants us to go away. Um, that's a, a great meme. You might have seen it where the cat is like, why are you in my house? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's exactly it. Um, I am actually starting to work on my first historical fiction. And um, okay. I'm really interested to read, to read Laura's other books. Um, and it, I would say that one of the things I loved about starting it was getting so immersed in this other world. And just, I mean, I love research. I went to, to graduate school for nonfiction and I love, love, love to learn about weird things and things from the past and the way people lived. And I finally said to my editor recently, I, I can't do it. I'm spending so much time trying really hard not to feel and just trying to get through the day and get my kids through all this and keep everything moving. And, you know, my job is pretty demanding too. Um, that it's really hard for me to write right now because you need to feel in order to write. And I just haven't really wanted to. <laughs> right. right. Survival mode. What time period are you working on? Um, Imperial China. It's like the Ooh. end of the, um, it's like the 1840s, 50s. And so it's the, um, the Imperial Court in China, and then Gold Rush, San Francisco. Oh, how interesting. Yeah, I'm really excited about it, but I just can't get my head into that place. Well, you know, I'm sure you're also dealing with the, the you, you touched upon what I love so much about the historical fiction or the biographical fiction that I do. I did, I stuck my book one to two of them up here. I, my last one was um, about the youngest Schuyler sister, Peggy Schuyler. Yes. Of who was an extraordinary, bodacious proto-feminist. She was great. And she happened to be at the right place at the right time to witness all the stuff that was going on, you know, with the war in upstate mm -hmm. New York, in this amazing spy ring that her father ran out of the Schuyler mansion. But what the hardest part about historical fiction is that it's so fascinating, all the information that you're absorbing. You're probably dealing with that too sometimes. Like, oh, there has to be something else I need to learn. You know, you just yeah. Can't, yeah, you can't, it's really if you enjoy the research, you're there is a rabbit hole that never yes. ends. So yeah. I'm glad that Peggy's not just Ann Peggy. She's no. uh, there's so much. No. To learn. no, she was amazing. I hope if you all like Hamilton, that you will pick up Ann Peggy because I truly, was, she, truly, she was. There were only 36 words right in the musical, but she was this highly <laughs> educated. Um, spoke French, taught herself German by reading her father's uh, engineering manuals. Mm -hmm. She was um, criticized by one of his BFFs as being a Swift's Vanessa, which if you know Jonathan Swift, it's one of his obscure poems. It's 18th century code for a woman who wants to talk politics too much to be entirely <laughs> <laughs> she, she And the thing that isn't, the one thing that was kind of like universally known about her is that she rushed into the fray of an attempted kidnapping of her father to scoop up her baby sister, uh, Katie, the baby who had been left to the cradle when everybody wow. else was running upstairs in terror. She was amazing. She was anyway. one tough cookie. I like her. Yeah. Thank you for president. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I hope you really enjoy this kind of genre as much as I have. It's, it's, and as somebody who loves to be a perpetual student, as obviously you do, yeah. there's nothing more kind of wonderful as a writer, I think. So anyway, that was an aside. Just, I'm sorry. But it's true. <laughs> it's Laura, what's brewing in your pot? I mean, what are you? Um, I just I just finished writing. It's interesting. I'm kind of a little schizophrenic. I'm called LM because the first book, you know, Under War Twin Sky was boy centric. 
20 years ago. Oh, they my. thought we came out, you know, that they thought boys wouldn't read a book written by a woman about World War II, so I became LM. Um, oh, oh so okay. That's <laughs> all right. You know what? It's, it's fine. It's, it's easier. It's just right. LM. Um, uh, so Peggy is kind of like I do these older YA, young adult, uh, new adults, you know, 20-year-olds to 30-year-olds kind mm -hmm. of books that is usually about women. And then I do these books that are um, more of the 13, 14, 15-year-old boy-centric books. Um, so I had done one about the McCarthy era, which was really kind of interesting. Oh, are you writing under different names? No, no. I'm under oh, Ellen Ellie. I have some picture oh. books of Laura Malone. Um, anyway, I just finished a book about the Berlin Wall going up. Um, and wow, going up. that's great. Yeah, because it went up overnight. It really wow. literally did. They had pre-planned it. They had 330 wow. tons of barbed wire waiting, and they literally started 15 minutes after midnight, and by dawn, you know, 30-some miles were barbed wired off. Wow. So it's about two boys, one um, a military kid, um, with the Berlin Brigade, mm -hmm. has a distant cousin on the East Berlin communist side who's been raised up in social, you know, philosophy and that kind of oppressive communist regime. So wow. it's really interesting. That'll come out August, um, in August. And I'm just starting on another World War II book for the wondrous Catherine Teagan. Fantastic. So, Laura, how do you get into the heads of boys? to write from that perspective? <laughs> um, I had a boy, I have a girl and a boy, so it's great, I've got both. Um, and <laughs> you follow them around all day. Yeah, <laughs> you know, the thing, the thing is though too, is that, and I was a tomboy growing up, um, and I, you probably, if you read Story Dog, you'll get the sense of, I grew up in those hills that I just talk about, and I love them, and so I was a little bit of a loner. I was out there on my own, I didn't really have gaggles of girls friends so it's not that hard for me to slip into the boy mindset especially since i was lucky enough to have access to my grandfather's library which was all about you know robert louis stevenson and all those great right. right and you know if you're a writer though here's the thing i always say to writers when I, you know young writers i want to hear everything you think internally i want to hear that i voice that first person you know all that you're feeling but you're really a writer when you can stand in somebody else's shoes and describe to me how they feel through their dialogue, through their clothes, through their, you know, and journalism taught me that really, you know, it's spending years and years of, of interviewing people and writing down what they were right. saying, hopefully verbatim, you know, yeah. you, you can stand in other people's minds. That's true. That's true. Jennifer yeah. does it too though. So many of your protagonists are boys. How do you do that? I have no idea. <laughs> I, mean, I have a boy um, uh, and I had a brother growing up and I just, I feel, um, I, I don't know. To me, they're, they were human, just little humans. Um, I definitely consulted with my son a lot on some dialogue. Um, and I also listened to, to kids talk, my kids talk a lot. Um, I guess that's how I would eavesdrop on their friends. Yeah. <laughs> but I do, but I did start to notice that I was writing so many books about boys that I really, it became important to me to start writing um, books with girls as protagonists. That is extremely important. It's good to have that dexterity. But I bet you, your kids are probably your best first readers. Mine certainly are. And for that very thing, you're talking about that authenticity, yep. you know, voice. And I actually just paid my son to um, do a first pass edit for me. <laughs> oh, good. How old is he? He's 14. Oh, my God. He did a really good job, too. Did you an aspiring oh, writer? I hope, I hope not. <laughs> for oh, his oh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, there we had a bunch of aspiring writers in the house. I became the, the you know, paid one, the profession, you know, the uh -huh actually writing and getting a check but um yeah but yeah so are they all readers in the house if they're readers they're writers well it's interesting i wonder well two things first of all my advice to people is always if you want to be a writer read just read 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 so it's funny you say that but um i another thing and i wonder if laura this was important to you when you were working on your books that i 
through my day job learned that that, that boys really drop off in reading yeah. at about eight, nine years old. Wow. And, um, and boys who are reluctant readers, um, often they fall off because they can't find anything that's really, really interesting to them. Yeah. And so part of the, the goal that I had, my editor and I set out to have with our, my first two series, Hero and Scout, was really just action-packed, fun, but heartfelt books that boys in that age range would gravitate toward. So I, I do think it's important to keep an eye on that. Yeah, no, you're you're exactly right, and and thank you for doing that because that is, you know, librarians. I'm sure you speak in schools a lot too. Librarians constantly say that that is it's that middle school time that, and you know, one of the things um, that I've been so impressed by is some schools are doing this battle of the books where kids will read a dozen books and then they compete. It's like an it's academic kind of competition among them. They do it in North Carolina and Virginia and a couple other states that I know. And it it adds that cool label to those boys when they're in seventh and eighth grade. But Jennifer is quite right. The, the, it's very hard to keep boys and it's such a shame. Um, they do become reluctant readers often then. And things that will really captivate them are the kind of adventure stories and bonding stories that you write. Um, World War II will capture them. I, you know, I often go to schools and they can tell me everything, the, all, all the mechanisms of their measurement, you know. Um, so, and I have joked sometimes that if you include bugs, battles, and beatable bullies, <laughs> you got your bullies. You know? and, and I really do, it, it, I'm really um, honored as I'm sure you are, to be writing for this age group because I hope that we are maintaining readers for the yep. you know the next generation. And both of my kids had been these voracious readers. And um, you know, my daughter just consumed everything she could get her hands on, as did my son. But as soon as he got onto these division one, you know, sports teams that he was on, um, fewer and fewer of, of his friends were like that. Mm. Um, having these kind of narratives that would kind of keep his peers going on it became important to me yeah yeah it's true and my feeling is there is uh as long as they're reading yeah. just right. Read. right whatever book you want there's a book for every reader just read yes yeah. you can tell your division one son that there's a lot of biographies out there about athletes <laughs> You know, well, that's, that's the thing, you know, boys, I mean, he, God, I can't tell you how many biographies he read. That's, that is what boys tend to drift in. I don't want to say drift. The ones who remain readers often go into biographies and nonfiction, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is great. But if we want to keep them in the fiction world, the kind of writing that Jen is doing, and I hope I do. Yeah. Also, now there's, sorry, Laura. Yeah. There's so much beautiful writing by Kwame Alexander and Jason yeah. Reynolds and all this, that, um, Jacqueline Woodson, all the, they're tackling sports and race and all these things in verse or in just really modern yeah. ways. And so I think that there, there are so many brilliant writers finding ways to bring that interest of boys into like, sort of to the next level. Yes, it's wonderful. Jerry Spinelli. Yeah, in Jerry Spinelli, yep. Yeah, 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 it's very true. So. Yeah. Well, ladies, I have to tell you, I, I, it was wonderful to meet you both, truly. I mean, I, and I hope you come to Nashville next year so I can really, I mean, not that this isn't really meeting you, but you know what I mean. <laughs> like, be lovely. Sure, be lovely. sure yep. you know, but, um, and I've been inspired by, by both of you because uh, I'm writing, but not books. And in fact, many people say I should write a book, but I keep telling them, no, I'm not going to write a book. <laughs> and that's that's what happens right before you write a book, John. Exactly. And if all it is, is just how, what, how a hundred of your articles put together from your Miami right. Herald days. So that's all it is. <laughs> no, it's my life. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so this has been great and I am honored to have hosted you and and learned about you and now i'm going to read all your books and uh, <laughs> no seriously and um and yeah and thank you so much for coming and and giving us your time and your experience and and i love it so thank, thank you. you it was great fun
I really so enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, one day I'll tell you about my Miami Herald days. <laughs> okay. All right. Over We're to you. the whole panel. <laughs> I'll meet you in Zoom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, thank ladies. Everyone. Have a great day, okay? Okay, thank you. All Thanks, right. Everybody. Thanks bye for bye. coming.